Why is the lion known as the king of beasts? The lion is one of the largest members of the cat family. Found mostly in the open country of Central Africa. A male lion can reach up to 9 feet, 2.7 meters, long, including his tail. And weigh almost 400 pounds, 182 kilograms, the female is somewhat smaller. Powerfully built, lions can take down large, swift running animals like zebra and antelope, on which they feed. Unique to the cat family, the male lion possesses a black or brown mane of long hair that grows on its neck, head, and shoulders. The mane can become quite enormous. The size and power of the male lion, his hunting habits, and his impressive mane have all likely contributed to his label as king of beasts. Lions also have commanding, thunderous roars, which can sometimes be heard more than a mile away. That, undoubtedly, have also contributed to their kingly reputation. How does nuclear energy work? We usually make heat energy by burning fuels oil, gas, coal, or wood. In large quantities, such energy can be used to heat water. And the resulting steam can be used to run generators that make electricity. Burning fuel, combustion, is a chemical reaction that converts one form of energy into another. It recombines elements from the fuel and the oxygen in the air into things like ash, smoke, and waste gases, as well as heat. A fission-generated nuclear reaction produces heat in a different way, it breaks apart elements themselves turning them into waste products with less mass, which creates a great amount of energy. The tiniest particles of matter atoms of heavy elements like uranium or plutonium provide the fuel for nuclear reactors. At the center of each atom is a nucleus, which is made up of even tinier particles called protons and neutrons. A nucleus is held together by a powerful force, and breaking up the nucleus releases that force. A nuclear reaction starts when fast-moving neutrons strike the nuclei of fuel atoms, causing them to break into smaller nuclei. These in turn release neutrons that break up more fuel nuclei. All this movement produces great heat, which can be used to make steam to run electric generators. The good thing about fission-generated nuclear energy is that very little fuel is needed to produce huge amounts of energy. Two pounds of nuclear fuel could produce as much energy as 6.5 million pounds of coal, for instance. The challenging part is that the process must be very carefully controlled. If it isn't controlled, the chain reaction behind it could create so much energy and heat in a fraction of a second that the result would be an enormous explosion. This explosion is exactly what occurs in nuclear weapons. In a nuclear reactor, Control rods that absorb neutrons are moved in and out of the core to control the process. 
a nuclear explosion is especially damaging because it releases harmful gamma rays known as radiation into the environment. This byproduct of nuclear fission is another problem connected with nuclear power. Nuclear reactors are encased in thick layers of steel and concrete to keep radiation from escaping. And because leftover nuclear fuel is highly radioactive, it must be carefully stored far away from people for decades or even centuries before it is safe again. Transporting and disposing of dangerous waste is another challenge presented by nuclear power. Most recently used fuel is sealed in safety containers and buried deep underground. The nuclear process that we get our power from is called fission. Where atomic nuclei that break apart produce great energy and heat. But nuclear power can also be created by a process called fusion, where atomic nuclei join together. Scientists are still working on creating a satisfactory fusion reactor. The sun produces its great energy and heat through the nuclear fusion of its hydrogen gases. Why do people do drugs? People may begin taking drugs out of a desire to rebel against their parents or society. Or because they long to experiment with new feelings and experiences. Many people take drugs to escape from problems with family or at school. For most people, drug use begins because they like the way. They feel when they are under a drug's influence, or high. Different drugs have different effects some are stimulants. Which means they give an energy boost and create a feeling of excitement. Others are depressants, which means they slow down the body's systems and produce a calm, relaxed feeling. But no matter how a drug makes you feel. It can't get rid of the things in your life that made you feel like escaping in the first place. In fact, drug use usually makes matters worse. Drugs reduce your ability to cope with difficult emotions on your own. And they will make problems you might be having in school or with your family even worse. While many people refuse to see the harmful effects of drugs, particularly when they first begin taking them. The fact is that every drug has the potential to be harmful, and many drugs can cause death. Drug habits are expensive, and they frequently cause unpleasant personality changes in the user. Which results in strained relationships with family members and friends. Many people make the mistake of believing that the more accessible legal drugs like cigarettes and alcohol are not as dangerous as illegal drugs. But legal drugs can have serious consequences if a person consumes very large quantities of alcohol. Even if it's his or her first time drinking, it can result in a coma or even death. Many young people wrongly believe that inhaling household chemicals produces an easy and safe high. But inhalants, by coating the lungs and preventing the absorption of oxygen, can also kill whether it's the first time or the 50th. One danger common to nearly all drugs is that, while under the influence, your judgment is impaired and you are more likely to do something that could harm yourself or others.
Are angels real? In many religions, angels are powerful spiritual beings who live with God but who sometimes become involved in the lives of people on earth, often bringing God's messages to them. According to the Bible, for instance, the angel Gabriel appeared before the Virgin Mary and announced that she would become the mother of Jesus Christ. In the Muslim religion, Gabriel revealed to the Prophet Muhammad the words of Allah, God, which were recorded in the Quran, the sacred book of Islam. Angels are not believed to have physical bodies, but they may look like people when visiting Earth. Over the centuries, artists have portrayed them in many ways, neither men nor women, angels have human forms. Appearing as babies, children, or adults, and are winged for travel to their heavenly home. In a few religions, like Roman Catholicism, it is believed that each person on earth has a special angel who watches over him or her and gives protection from the temptations of the devil. Such a being is called one's guardian angel. The answer to the question of whether angels are real, then, is a matter of faith. What is my tongue for? Without your tongue it would be nearly impossible to do three important functions, eat, taste, and talk. The tongue is a complex group of muscles that moves food around your mouth as you chew and finally molds it into a ball for swallowing. Just try eating anything without using your tongue. In addition, taste buds clusters of special cells located on the surface of your tongue are mostly responsible for your ability to taste food and drink. Although other parts of your mouth have some taste buds, too. Your 9,000 or so taste buds can recognize four types of flavors, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Besides helping you enjoy food. Tasting is very important because it keeps you from eating food that has spoiled and is unsafe. Finally, your tongue along with your mouth and lips helps you to make the special sounds you use to speak. Could a person be moved safely from one place to another by a tornado? Like Dorothy in the movie The Wizard of Ounce? No records show the survival of a person who has traveled long distances in a tornado. It is unlikely that any individual, or the structure in which he or she took shelter could withstand the fierce sucking winds inside a tornado which sometimes take objects from the ground and carry them high into the atmosphere for many miles and remember such a ride would eventually include a treacherous fall to the ground still some records exist of non-living things that have survived wild tornado rides. In the summer of 1953, for instance, a woman in Massachusetts found a wedding gown in her backyard, dirty but in good condition. It had been carried some 50 miles, 80 kilometers, by a tornado. 
In the spring of 1979 people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, saw small slips of paper falling from the sky. These papers were cancelled checks coming from a bank struck by a tornado earlier that day. The bank was located in a city in Texas, more than 200 miles, 322 kilometers, away. Do ostriches really bury their heads in sand? This supposed ostrich behavior has been referred to countless times in warning. People not to bury their heads in the sand and ignore their problems. But the fact is that ostriches do not bury their heads in sand when danger approaches. They kick up their heels and run. Sometimes, to avoid being seen by nearby predators. The very tall ostrich will lie down and stretch its neck out on the ground. This behavior may have been spotted and misunderstood by people. Who began the tale of an ostrich burying its head in the sand? Ostriches also occasionally nibble on small pebbles or sand. A behavior that may give an observer the impression that they are trying to burrow into the sand. What happens to our garbage after it's collected? A garbage truck probably comes to your neighborhood once a week to pick up your family's trash. On other days garbage trucks are at work in other parts of your city. Sometimes trash that can't be reused or recycled is taken away to an incinerator plant. Where it is burned into ash. Most often garbage is taken to a landfill, a huge hole in the ground commonly known as a garbage dump. Both methods of disposal cause problems. Burning garbage creates waste products that enter the air, causing pollution. Landfills use up precious space, there are more than 9,000 in the United States. And are so ugly and smelly that few communities want one located near them. Transporting trash to distant landfills is troublesome and expensive. The best way to handle garbage is to make less of it developing habits that are not wasteful and to reuse and recycle the trash that we can't avoid making. Americans produce about 230 million tons of garbage each year. In order to get as much garbage as possible into a landfill, it is crushed and tightly packed into its space. At the end of each day, new trash is covered with a layer of dirt to keep germs from spreading and to keep creatures like rats and flies away. Pipes have to be inserted into landfill sites to allow the escape of gases that are produced when garbage decomposes. If this wasn't done, the gases could explode. Once garbage nears the top of a landfill, the hole is sealed off and covered with tons of dirt. Over time, when decomposition has stopped and all dangerous gases have escaped, the spot can be used for other things. One northern community, for example, built a great sledding hill on top of its landfill.
What should I do if I find a gun? Studies have shown that hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of children and teenagers are accidentally killed by guns in the United States each year. Millions of American kids have access to guns in their homes. People use guns all the time in movies and television shows. And the action scenes in these shows make guns look exciting and powerful. What these shows can't really convey is the massive, painful destruction an exploding bullet causes when it hits a person's body. While many kids understand that, in real life, Guns can be very dangerous and can cause great harm, most still find guns fascinating. If an adult is supervising and your parents have given their approval, it's okay to look at and even touch an unloaded gun. But if you are alone or with other kids and you come across a gun, remember that it is not a toy and should not be handled. Guns should never be pointed at another person, even if you intend it as a joke. If you find a gun in your own house, a friend's house, or elsewhere, as tempting as it might be to play with it, remember the damage that guns can cause and leave it alone. If you're away from home, leave right away and tell your parents what happened. Your parents may be upset and worried that you found a gun. But they will be very glad that you told them about it because then they can help you stay safe. Which tree is the tallest? Along the coast of Northern California and Southern Oregon, where the climate is cool and moist, live some of the largest and most ancient trees in the world. They are sequoia trees, commonly known as redwoods because of the color of their bark and wood. There are two kinds of these conifers, which have scale like leaves. The giant redwood, Sequoia sempervirens, is the tallest tree on earth. It can grow up to 385 feet, 117 meters, about as tall as a 37-story building. Its trunk can measure up to 25 feet, 7.6 meters, in diameter. Many are more than 2,000 years old. The other giant sequoia, Sequoia dendron gigantum, isn't quite as tall, but it is wider and heavier. It can grow up to 325 feet, 99 meters, and have a trunk with a diameter up to 30 feet, 9.1 meters. With the biggest of these trees weighing an estimated 2,500 tons. They are considered the largest living things in the world, even bigger than blue whales. They have also been around longer than giant redwoods, with many almost 4,000 years old. Because the wood of sequoias is strong, beautiful, and decay resistant. Many of these rare and ancient trees have been cut down in past decades and used for building. Replacing such trees is difficult, as they can take up to 500 years to reach maturity. But now they are protected in some 30 national parks. If you go to the central west coast of the United States you can visit these special forests. 
you may even be able to drive your car through tunnels that have been carved out of the tree's huge trunks. How many eggs can a chicken lay? Today, certain breeds of chickens are raised to be eaten because they grow quickly and have a lot of flesh. Other breeds are good egg layers and are raised for that purpose. The best kind of laying hen can produce one or more eggs every day of its adult life. Which lasts about a year. A hen that lays large eggs like the popular leghorn breed is. Desirable because more money can be charged for larger eggs. Before modern farming, chickens were kept in special houses called coops. Where they had nests and laid their eggs, which were later gathered by hand by farm members. They were fed kitchen scraps and spare grain, and they spent their days pecking away in farmyards. Looking for insects or seeds or any other food they could find. At night they were shut into their coops, warm and safe from hungry wild animals like foxes. Only small numbers of chickens were kept and only limited numbers of eggs were produced. Today to keep up with the world's growing need for food and to maximize profits most chicken farmers keep the birds in huge. Mechanized, indoor structures that house more than 100,000 birds at a time. Growing conditions like temperature and light are carefully controlled. And scientifically developed feed is used to cause quick growth and rapid egg production. Laying hens never leave their cages and their eggs are collected automatically, by machine. Why do hyenas laugh? Hyenas aren't really laughing. But some of the noises they make to communicate sound like loud, crazy laughter. Hyenas are usually scavengers, living on carrion, which is the rotting remains of dead animals. They have even been known to rob human graves for food. Sometimes hyenas do hunt live animals, however, attacking in packs. Mostly nocturnal, which means that they rest during the day and are active at night. Hyenas have on occasion entered villages and attacked livestock and sleeping people. The unsavory diet of the hyena gives it a bad smell. It is also not an attractive animal. With scruffy fur and hind legs that are much shorter than its forelegs, giving it a skulking appearance. Still, hyenas perform a valuable service in Earth's food chain as scavengers. Ridding the environment of dead animal remains. How do farmers grow food? Raising crops involves a few simple principles. Although farming has been around for about 10. 000 years a vast sweep of time in which tools and methods have changed a great deal the basic principles remain the same. The first step in farming involves preparing the land for planting. 
The second step involves planting the seeds, or cuttings or seedlings. The third step involves helping the seeds to grow. The fourth step involves harvesting the mature plants and often processing them so that they can be used as food. Fruit growing and raising livestock for milk and meat are other types of farming. Preparing land for planting involves breaking up the soil with a plow. Early plows were heavy pointed sticks that people pushed through the earth. Later, the points of plows were made of iron, and their shape became broader and flatter. Plow blades are called shears. These plows sliced bigger furrows, big grooves, into the soil and flipped it over as well. While first powered by people, plows were soon designed to be pulled by animals because they had to be heavy to cut through hard ground. Usually a team of oxen or horses pulled a plow while a farmer guided and pushed it from behind. Today, powerful tractors pull plows that dig up several furrows at a time. After plowing, early farmers pulled heavy rollers and harrows flat rake-like devices over the broken soil to make it even finer and ready for planting. Today, cultivators with rows of pointed metal prongs are pulled behind tractors to do the same job. Before planting machines, farmers sowed seeds by hand. It was a wasteful process because the wind blew seeds away as they were. Scattered and hungry birds ate them before they could be covered up by dirt. But in the early 18th century an English farmer named Jethro Tull greatly improved the sowing process by inventing the seed drill. It was a machine that cut several grooves into the soil and then dropped small amounts of seeds held in a compartment called a hopper down tubes or shoots into the neat rows. Crops could be grown in straight lines then, which made weeding easier. Special hoeing machines were made with blades that fit between rows of crops to uproot weeds. Like a plow, the seed drill was usually pulled by horses and guided by a farmer who walked behind it. Today, of course, tractors provide the power that pulls similar sewing machines. There was not a lot that early farmers could do to help seeds grow once they were in the ground. At that point, it was really up to nature to provide the things that were needed for growth like warmth sunlight, and water in the right amounts. Early farmers could add natural fertilizers, like manure, to enrich soil. And they could pull weeds that competed with growing plants. They knew about the benefits of rotating crops. Growing different plants in different fields each year to keep the soil fertile and free of diseases and pests. In dry areas, early farmers even developed irrigation systems that delivered water to crops. But modern science has given today's farmers many more reliable tools to help seeds grow. Chemical insecticides, for example, kill pests that threaten crops and selective herbicides kill weeds without damaging growing plants, other chemicals called fungicides help eliminate plant diseases. In addition, genetically altered plants and chemical fertilizers have allowed modern farmers to grow more plants than ever before. Before modern machinery, Harvesting crops was a painstaking process. 
Gathering and removing mature plants from the field had to be done by hand. Farm workers used sharp blade. Long-handled scythes and curved sickles to cut down cereal crops like wheat. Even the fastest reaper could only clear about a third of an acre a day. Because rain could ruin harvested wheat, workers called sheaf makers quickly tied it into bundles. So that it could be safely stored if the weather turned stormy. During the long winter months farm workers used jointed wooden tools called flails to thresh or beat the dried wheat in order to separate its edible grain seeds from its stalks. But in 1786 a machine that threshed wheat by rubbing it between rollers was invented. Replacing human threshers and around 1,840 a reaping machine whose revolving wheel pressed grain. Stocks against a sharp blade that cut them down replaced human harvesters. Today, farm machines called combined harvesters do this work in much the same way. These machines are very efficient and combine all three jobs of cutting, collecting, and threshing a crop. A single combine harvester can process 5 acres of wheat in less than an hour. Why do I feel thirsty? When your body is low on water, or dehydrated, the moist lining of your mouth and throat become dry. Thirst sensors there send a message to your brain, which tells you to drink at once. About three-fourths of the human body is made of fluids. And the average adult must take in about two and one-half quarts, about two and one-half liters, of water. And other healthy beverages, like fruit juice, every day to remain healthy. Though some of the fluids we need also come from solid foods, which contain large amounts of water. Sometimes you may feel thirsty even when your body isn't dehydrated, things like dry. Dusty air or salty food can draw moisture from your mouth and throat, alerting your thirst sensors. To demonstrate this, try swallowing dry crackers without taking a drink. Can an octopus really make ink? An octopus, so named because it has eight arms, is generally a shy, gentle creature. But if it is attacked, it will fight back. One method it has of escaping from a predator is to eject an ink-like substance into the water that makes it hard for the attacker to see what's in front of it. Before the ink clears, the octopus has scurried away. Some octopuses, or octopi, can even produce an ink that temporarily paralyzes the predator's senses. Another way for the octopus to escape is to shoot out a powerful stream of water. Using jet propulsion to rapidly push itself away from danger. Octopuses can also quickly change the color of their skin, camouflaging themselves from predators. There are many different kinds of octopuses, and they vary widely in size. The smallest ones are only about 2 inches, 5 centimeters. Long, and the largest can be 18 feet long, 5.4 meters. 
the arm span of the largest octopuses can reach 30 feet, 9 meters. The best known species is a medium-sized one, about 3 feet, or 90 centimeters, known as the common octopus. In terms of intelligence, this animal is not so common. Scientists believe that the common octopus is the smartest of all the invertebrate animals. Unlike most invertebrates, octopuses and such relatives as squid have complex, highly developed eyes, giving them the ability to see images. How does a copy machine work? Most photocopiers are machines that use static electricity and powder. Rather than ink, to print copies on plain paper. Once you place the page you want reproduced onto the glass plate on top of the copy machine and close its lid. A strong light inside sweeps across the page. With the help of a lens the image from your page is reflected. On the outside of a turning metal cylinder or drum below. Invisible positive charges of static electricity create an image on the drum. Dark parts of your image are more strongly charged than light parts. Negatively charged black powder called toner is dusted across the surface of the drum. Sticking most to wherever the positive charges are strongest. Then the drum. Rolls across a blank piece of paper, and the powder is transferred to its surface. In order to make the powder stick, though, it must be melted onto the paper. This melting occurs when the paper passes through heated rollers. Your copy is now complete and slides out of the machine. This dry ink method of copying works well because images instantly stick to the drum and are just as quickly removed. Enabling the photocopier to be ready for immediate reuse. The process is repeated from beginning to end whether you want more. Then one copy of your page or need to copy a new page altogether. Why is the North Star important? The North Star, also known as Polaris, is important because it is the star toward which the northern axis of Earth points. It appears to shine directly over the North Pole. In ancient times, centuries before the use of navigational equipment, travelers knew that they could count on Polaris to tell them which direction was north. How does a sprouting seed know which way is up? Earth's gravity is the force that guides the direction of a sprouting seed's roots and shoots. In scientific experiments where plants are put in zero-gravity environments, they grow in all directions. Roots respond to the pull of gravity, which generates from the center of Earth. By growing toward it, and shoots, or stems, respond to gravity by growing away from it. Scientists do not completely understand how a plant's cells receive the signals that point different parts in different directions. 
but simple experiments show that no matter which way a seed is planted, with the root producing part facing down or up, the roots will grow down and the shoots will grow up. Heavy starch grains found in certain cells help the growing plant keep its balance by shifting their place if the plant loses its upright position. This shifting directs growth hormones to affected areas in the plant. These hormones will cause new growth in stems and roots to correct their position in relation to gravity. In the shoot, for example, growth hormones will make cells toward the bottom grow faster than cells toward the top, pushing the shoot upward. How are moths different from butterflies? While moths and butterflies are very similar and belong to the same order of insects. Lepidoptera, there are noticeable differences between them. Butterflies are generally active during the day, and moths are usually nocturnal, or active at night. Butterflies have knobs on the ends of their antennae, while moths do not. Butterflies tend to be more colorful than moths. And moths and butterflies hold their wings differently when at rest, moths lay theirs out flat. Like an airplane, while butterflies hold theirs vertically above their bodies. Do any mammals have scales? Mammals are usually identified by their furry outer layer, but there are some mammals with a hard scaly covering that makes them look more like reptiles than mammals. The pangolin, which lives in parts of Asia and Africa, is covered with scale-like plates that are actually modified hairs. Pangolins eat mostly ants and termites, foraging with their pointy snouts and their long, worm-like tongues. They protect themselves from predators by rolling themselves into a tight ball and sticking their sharp scales out. The armadillo is another mammal with an unusual outer layer. Covered in protective, solid plates of armor over most of its body. The armadillo looks like an animal from prehistoric times. These shy, nocturnal animals are more likely to run away from potential enemies than to fight. When threatened, some species can pull their legs underneath their armor like a turtle retreating into its shell. And some armadillos will curl into a protective ball like the pangolin. How large is the world's biggest spider? The largest known spiders in the world are the Goliath bird eating spiders which live in the coastal rainforests of northeastern South America. They can become as big as dinner plates. The largest recorded specimen had a leg span of 11 inches, 28 centimeters. This spider, a type of tarantula, has a somewhat misleading name. So-called bird-eating spiders don't usually eat birds but instead dine on snakes, frogs, and insects.
Why do babies and toddlers have to wear diapers? The bodies of babies and little children go through a lot of growing and changing. The ability of little ones to do things like control the activity of their bladder and bowels increases as their muscles and nervous systems develop and mature. When a person's bladder is filled with urine, stretch sensors located in the bladder wall send a message to the brain, which sends back a message to empty it. Still, most people can delay this need to urinate by controlling the urethral sphincter. A muscle located at the opening of the bladder into the urethra, the tube through which urine exits the body. When a child is very young, however, he or she does not yet have this kind of muscle control. In addition, a small child's brain doesn't connect feelings of a full bladder with the urination that comes afterwards. In the bodies of babies and young children, urination happens automatically and often like a reflex and a diaper is needed to keep them and their surroundings clean. Between the ages of 2 and 3, though, children become aware of their body signals and have greater muscle control. And they are able to be potty trained, or taught to use the toilet. Likewise, when a person's rectum is filled with feces, nerve endings there transmit a similar message to the brain, which calls for it to be emptied. Whether the individual has a bowel movement, though, depends on whether he or she consciously relaxes the ring of muscles. Called the anal sphincter, around the anus to allow the passage of feces. Before young children can do this as with urination they must learn to recognize the signals their bodies give them and have good muscle control. What is nectar? Nectar is a sweet liquid made in special glands called nectaries in flowering plants. Located deep within a flower, at the base of its petals. Nectar is an important part of the diets of many insects and animals. The most important gatherers of nectar are honeybees. Which bring it back to their hives to make delicious honey. Why do birds migrate? Many species of birds spend part of the year the warmer months in northern regions. And then migrate south when the weather starts to get cold. Birds follow this southward path primarily in search of an abundant, accessible food supply. Birds use up the energy they get from food very quickly, and they need to eat often. So when the ground begins to freeze and food supplies, particularly insects, are harder to find, many birds head south. Birds that spend a lot of time in water ducks and geese, for example have an additional reason to migrate. The northern lakes and ponds where they lie freeze over in the winter. Migrating birds spend the winter months in the warmer, southern climate. And as spring returns to the north, 
so do migrating birds. Why do flowers look different from one another? The way a flower looks depends a lot on the way it is pollinated. Flowers that depend on the wind for pollination are usually small and plain looking. Because they don't need to attract the attention of insects and birds to carry their pollen. But flowers that do depend on the carrier method need ways. To attract the animals that will help them cross pollinate. And flowers are often structured in terms of color, scent. And shape to suit a particular insect or animal visitor. Many flowers attractive to bees have parts that act as landing platforms. So the bees that visit them can rest their heavy bodies while feeding. Bees can see most colors, except red, and they are attracted to colorful flowers. And because bees use long sucking tubes to collect pollen and nectar, the flowers that they visit often have long, narrow shapes. Butterflies like many of the same flowers that bees do. They, too, have long, sucking mouth parts and like to land when feeding. Their large wings keep them from traveling deep into flowers, though. For this reason they prefer flowers that are flat, broad and clustered. Butterflies are attracted to all bright colors. Moths, which are similar to butterflies, are nocturnal, which means they are active at night. So the flow ERS they are attracted to tend to be light colored. Or white the kinds of flowers that show up well in the dark. And because moths tend to hover in the air when feeding. They need no landing platforms on the flowers they visit. Hummingbirds have a poor sense of smell but see color well. The flowers they prefer are bright red or orange and supply plenty of nectar in their deep. Narrow blooms. Flowers pollinated by flies which are attracted to decaying matter, where they tend to lay their eggs. Are generally dark green, purple, or brown colors that resemble the rotted material flies prefer. The flowers that bats feed from have large openings for their snouts. And strong parts that the animals can grip onto with their claws. What is a clone? To understand cloning, we must first understand a few things about cells. All living things, from the simplest to the most complex, are made up of cells. Cells are specialized to perform a variety of functions there are muscle cells. Skin cells, nerve cells, and so on. Cells group together to form tissue. And tissues group together to make organs like the heart, liver, and kidneys. An organism grows and develops through a process called cell division. One cell divides into two. Then each of those two divides again, and so on until eventually, in the case of human beings. Trillions of cells have been produced to make up a complete living person. All cells in multicellular organisms contain a nucleus, which acts as the command center of the cell. 
the nucleus contains all of the organism's genetic material, including the DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, which determines whether a rose will be red or yellow, whether a person will have curly hair or straight. The word clone can refer to a group of cells that share the same genetic material or to two or more complete organisms that are genetically identical. That means that the clone is an exact copy of one of its parents. Whereas we are made up of the combined features of both our parents. Cloning does occur naturally simple organisms like bacteria, for example, reproduce asexually. Which means new organisms come from only one parent and share that parent's genetic material. When humans and other animals produce identical twins. Those twins are clones of each other, though not of either parent. But the kind of cloning we hear about in school or on the news is engineered by scientists. Scientists have been conducting experiments for years in an attempt to create a complex organism that is a clone of another organism. While they had some success over the years cloning frogs and salamanders, nothing captured the world's attention like the breakthrough scientists made at the Rosslyn Institute in Scotland in 1996. After 276 failed attempts, a group of scientists led by Ian Wilmot successfully cloned a sheep, named Dolly, the first mammal ever to be cloned. The process used to create the cloned sheep, called somatic cell nuclear transfer, began with an egg cell from one sheep. The scientists destroyed that egg cell's nucleus and then injected the nucleus from the cell of another sheep into the egg cell. With a little encouragement from electronic stimulation, the donated nucleus fused with the egg cell, and the new cell began to divide. The cluster of cells was then implanted into the uterus of the sheep that had provided the egg cell. And five months later Dolly was born an exact replica not of the sheep that had carried her in the womb but of the sheep that had supplied the nucleus. While cloning mammals is very controversial, some scientists argue that it could have many benefits. Under the right circumstances, cloning could be used to increase the population of animals that are listed as endangered species. Cloning also has advantages to livestock farmers, who could use the technology to breed only high-quality animals that produce the most milk or the finest wool. How is a lake different from a sea or ocean? A lake is different from a sea or ocean because it is completely surrounded by land. It is situated in a basin or hollow on Earth's surface and is usually shallow compared to a sea or ocean. Most lakes contain fresh water though some especially those located in dry areas are filled with salt water. Lakes may get their water supply from rivers that empty into them. Or from underground springs, or from rain or melted snow. Lake Superior, located on the border between the United States and Canada, is the largest freshwater lake in the world, covering 31,700 square miles, 82,103 square kilometers. 
Lake Baikal, located in Russia, is the deepest freshwater lake, reaching down 6,365 feet, 1,940 meters. What is a salamander? A salamander is an amphibian that usually has four legs and a tail that is almost as long as its body. There are hundreds of different types of salamanders, including newts, mud puppies, and hellbenders. Like other amphibians, salamanders hatch from eggs laid in water or moist areas. They then go through a larval, youth, stage as aquatic creatures with gills. Eventually metamorphosing, or changing, into air-breathing adults that live on land. Some salamander species, like the mud puppy, keep their gills in adulthood. Some types of newts, after graduating from aquatic larvae to land-dwelling adults. At which point they are called efts will spend a couple years on land only to return to water permanently. They continue to breathe through lungs, and through their skin. But they spend the rest of their days living in the water. Do all plants have roots? The simplest types of plants don't have roots. Single celled green algae, for instance, float on water surfaces. As do many types of seaweed, which are larger types of algae. Those seaweeds that do cling to the seabed do so through growths called steadfasts, which are not true roots. Seaweed absorbs water and minerals from the sea through all its parts. Similarly, simple plants like mosses form low-growing mats in damp places. Soaking up the moisture they need directly from their environment. Instead of roots they have thread-like growths called rhizoids that anchor them to rocks or trees. More complex forms of plants, though, like ferns, conifers, cone-bearing plants, and flowering plants, all have true roots and stems an internal transportation system that can move water and minerals from their source to wherever they are needed. Land plants have two types of roots, tap roots and fibrous roots. A plant's root type is often determined by its water source. A tap root is a large, single root that grows straight down to reach water deep in the soil. With smaller roots branching off of it. Fibrous roots have no main root but spread out in a wide web to gather water located in the top layers of soil. In places like rainforests where there is abundant plant growth with little ground space for roots and plenty of moisture some plants grow high up in trees. These epiphytes, or air plants, have fibrous, spongy, aerial roots that get moisture from the frequent rains and take minerals from the surface of the tree on which they grow or from the plant debris that gathers around their roots. Many orchids are epiphytic plants. Why do whales blow water up into the air?
a whale has one or two nostrils or blowholes located far back on the top of its head. A toothed whale has one, a baleen whale has two. Whales can only breathe through their blowholes, which are directly connected to their lungs. Their mouths lead only to the stomach. Blowholes have valves that close when a whale dives. A whale may dive as deep as one mile below the ocean surface and stay underwater for well over an hour. When a whale returns to the surface it spouts, blowing the warm, moist air that has formed in its lungs out through its blowholes before it takes a fresh breath. The water that has collected on top of the blowholes gets blown into the air along with the whale's breath. Sometimes, the spouting of a large whale can be seen for miles. The type of whale can often be identified by the shape of its spout. What makes blood red? Blood contains a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, which contains iron, is found in red blood cells and is the ingredient that makes blood red. Hemoglobin transports oxygen from the lungs to wherever it's needed throughout your body. You probably noticed that sometimes blood is bright red, while other times it is dark red. The difference in color comes from the changing amounts of oxygen in the blood. Arteries, a type of blood vessel, carry blood away from the lungs and heart to the rest of your body. That blood is rich in oxygen, which joins with hemoglobin to give the blood its bright red color. Tiny blood vessels called capillaries, which have narrow walls through which tiny substances can pass. Distribute oxygen and nutrients to all of your body's cells. One of the waste products produced by your body's cells is the gas carbon dioxide, which enters your bloodstream by slipping through the capillary walls. The capillaries take that oxygen poor, carbon dioxide filled blood to the veins. Another type of blood vessel, which carry the blood back to the lungs and heart. The lack of oxygen in this blood gives it a dark red, almost purplish color. When that blood reaches the lungs, the carbon dioxide in it is transferred to your lungs. When your brain receives a signal that carbon dioxide is building up in your lungs, it causes you to exhale, or breathe out, expelling all that carbon dioxide into the air. You then inhale, or breathe in, oxygen, which goes to your lungs, and the process begins again. What is pollution? Pollution refers to excessive amounts of waste, much of which contains harmful poisons that are released into the environment air, water, and soil. Pollution is usually caused by people, more specifically it is caused by the waste produced by the cars we drive. The factories that make the things we buy. The power plants that produce the gas and electricity we use, and even the farms that grow the food we eat. Pollution has been a problem ever since large numbers of people occupied a relatively small space. During the 1800s and 1900s, however, 
as the world became increasingly crowded. And more and more factories were built, environmental pollution became a serious issue. Air pollution is caused primarily by the burning of fuel. Gas-powered transportation methods airplanes, cars, boats, and trains are the biggest culprits. The amount of fuel required to heat and cool homes and other buildings also contributes huge amounts of air pollution. Air pollutants damage Earth's atmosphere and harm plants and animals, including humans. Water pollution comes from a variety of sources. Any factory that makes things toys, tires, steel creates waste products as well. This waste, filled with toxic chemicals, is often released into bodies of water, including lakes, rivers, and oceans. Other harmful water pollutants include sewage, which is human and animal waste. Most sewage is somewhat filtered in septic tanks and treatment plants. But some raw sewage still gets released into water. The chemicals used to control pests and fertilize plants on farms also ends up in lakes and rivers when rainwater drains from the farmland to the bodies of water. Ships carrying massive quantities of oil have also been responsible for polluting the water. If those ships break apart, the oil spills into the water killing birds and fish and damaging the shoreline. The world's oceans and rivers can break down some pollutants into forms that are either harmless or beneficial to aquatic life. But when pollution levels become too high, the plants and animals living in the water suffer. Land pollution comes primarily from garbage. Some types of garbage paper, plastic, some metals, glass. And so on are recyclable, meaning they can be processed and reused. Some garbage is biodegradable, which means it will naturally break down into tiny particles that can be reused by the environment. Vast quantities of the garbage we produce, however, is not easily broken down or recycled. Garbage is usually dumped in landfills, and as some things slowly decay. A harmful gas called methane is released into the air. Another source of land pollution are the chemicals used on farms. Some of those chemicals are washed into bodies of water. And some are absorbed by the ground where they can harm various forms of plant and animal life. How can scientists tell the age of fossils? Scientists can learn many things about the conditions on the planet and ancient animal behavior from fossils. They can learn whether an area was once covered by lush forests. For example, or they can determine that some dinosaurs traveled in herds. They can also tell, in many cases, how long ago the fossilized plant or animal lived. One way to narrow down a fossil's age is by seeing what layer, or strata, of rock it appears in the deepest layers contain the oldest fossils, while the top layers contain the most recent fossils. If they know the history of other fossils found nearby, specifically when these other animals lived, 
then they can determine the approximate age of newly found fossils. In some cases, scientists can pinpoint the age of a fossil by measuring something called a radioactive isotope. An isotope can be thought of as a version of a chemical element, like hydrogen, or carbon, that has a slightly different atomic makeup than other versions of that element. For example, one isotope of hydrogen has one particle, a proton, in the nucleus. Another isotope has two particles, a proton, and a neutron. Both are hydrogen, but they are different types of hydrogen. A radioactive isotope is one that is unstable and gives off some radiation. Over time, radioactive isotopes decay, forming a different chemical element altogether. For example, uranium eventually changes into lead. Scientists know how long it takes for various radioactive isotopes to decay. They discuss this time in terms of the isotope's half-life. Or the amount of time it takes for half of the isotope to decay. If a radioactive isotope has a 1,000-year half-life, then half of it will have decayed in. 1,000 years and all of it will have decayed, or turned into another element, in 2,000 years. So let's say a scientist measures the amount of a radioactive isotope in a chunk of rock. Knowing that this element will have completely transformed into another element after 2,000 years. If the scientist finds very little of the isotope and a great deal of the element it turns into, then he or she knows that the rock and the fossil found in it is almost 2,000 years old.